Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome to Policy and Rights, the show about government policy and human rights. Welcome back to Policy and Race here on Depictions Media Radio. I'm your host, Michael Cloggs. There have been some very interesting developments with uh, the U.S. Supreme Court. And that, they, well, they agreed on, or it, it passed, the presidential immunity, which means the former President Donald Trump cannot be held accountable for criminal acts that he committed while he was President of the United States. It also means that future presidents can act in criminal ways and because they were a former president that they will be held immune or unaccountable for their actions. It, 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 uh, you're going to hear hear some statements. One, you're going to hear statements from a um, another political pro- blogger in um, in the U.S. Um, and her. Uh, if if you want to follow her, please go to X and follow her at um, I am political. I am a politics girl um, on X, and listen to what she has. I'm going to play play what she had to say as a reaction to what the U.S. Supreme Court ruled on, and what it and, and what it could potentially mean for the United States. The, here's the thing, though. Because even if you're in not in the United States, the model of democracy, free votes, those sort of things, was developed um, in the United States. That a lot of a, a lot of what we what we see as voting. And who can vote in, and why we see a lot of masses being able to vote in the countries and not just a select few in so many countries is because of that model in the United States. There are there are some difficulties with this, and that uh, economic difficulties that, that um, on maybe only certain states actually do cast a vote for the president. But as far as representation is concerned and being able in that the president of the United States was held more accountable to the law than any other office in the country because he is the commander-in-chief of the armed forces one of the largest armed forces in the world I think um, the Russian Federation is is, um, of course a close very close in in power and number of soldiers and armaments. Um, I think I did see somewhere that uh, the Russian Federation has more nuclear weapons. Well, 
hell the 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 U.S. may have more airplanes. Two of the largest armed forces in the world are governed by the Russian Federation president and the president of the United States. The president of the United States has always for uh, say 240 years or so has been governed by a set of rules and laws into how he conducts business. Donald Trump wanted the wanted that removed, and he was successful in his arguments in removing what he called handcuffs. The way the the U.S. government is supposed to work, the executive office did not have absolute power. The executive office had a limitation to power. He had checks and balances that he was supposed to use. Which meant that he could be outvoted or overridden. It also me- means that that no particular branch, rather it be the, the House of Representatives or the Senate, also did not have absolute power. They couldn't just vote something into place. It also meant that the Judicial Department, which includes the Supreme Court of the United States, didn't have absolute power over anything either. Now we're going to see a bounce. That power is now going to be out of balance with with the President. The president was never meant to be king of the United States. He was meant to be a citizen, an elected member of the people of the United States, a representative to the rest of the world. And his power did hold limitations limitations that were put in place by the original members of Congress written into in into the into the Constitution by Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, great men who wanted to see equality happen in the future. And what we have seen today, or what we saw um, over the weekend, the end of last week, is all of those ideas thrown out the window. I implore everyone who is listening to this podcast that we need to vote, we need to voice our opinions, and we need to remove those who would abuse their power out of office. We need to find those leaders who are leaders, who don't want to cause another Ukraine war in Ukraine who don't want to cause another I don't know what you call it in in Gaza which we're going to hear about Gaza um, later on in this show what is happening the how human rights and human dignity have been tossed out the window by um, the Prime Minister of Israel Netanyahu 
We need to find leaders who don't want to keep doing this. We need to find leaders who want to lead us in directions of great humanity. Where we all find equality, we all find ideas that would make our human race, our human planet, a great thing. Okay, so I have ranted far, far longer than my friend in in the United States. Um, uh, if please do follow her at I am Poli uh, politics girl on X. We're going to start off with with her rant and her, her disappointment in what the U.S. Supreme Court uh, ruling was. We're going to hear from um, President Joe Biden as he talks a little bit about it and his disappointment and his call for dissent against it. We are also going to hear um, as the uh, Russian Federation becomes president of the UN Security Council and the work that they are starting on with Gaza and how they want to help the people of, of Gaza um, recover from the ongoing slaughter that is happening in that region. Also, I mean, it, there has to be a balance, right? Because the Hamas has to return those hostages and has to and has to return them immediately as as we are asking that Israel lay down their arms immediately stop the fighting so why don't we start off and we're going to listen to um, politics girl as she made her rant on X and again I ask you to go follow her subscribe to, to her podcast and hear what what is really happening with U.S. politics um, as we're watching a, I don't know how to describe the sadness I have for what I'm watching in, in history right now happening um, in the U.S. and what could be happening around the world for everyone with democracy. So the U.S. Supreme Court has now ruled that President Trump has immunity for official acts. So what does that mean? It means that Project 2025 and the takeover of the administrative state and the dismantling of the checks and balances of the American government, including 250 years of self-rule, is now underway. So people need to get really serious really fast. No one cares if you don't like the candidates. No one cares if you don't like your options. No one cares if you wish there was a third party or something better. We are watching a Christo-fascist authoritarian takeover of America. So what are you going to do about it? Will you defend our nation against a presidency with unchecked power? Do you believe that the American president should run our country like Russia, where the leader can never lose and political rivals are murdered and anyone who speaks up against the government falls out of a frickin' window? Because that's where we are, people. This isn't a drill. Six members of our Supreme Court have been compromised. They work on behalf of the religious right and the billionaire class, and they just made it possible for our president to be a king. We are about to celebrate the 4th of July our Independence Day as a nation of the people, by the people, for the people. And this corrupt court has just taken everything that our founding fathers and framers created and set it on fire. So we need to decide what we're going to do about it good and fast, or this is the last election this country will ever have. Wake up to where we sit in history and what our choices are now. Stop complaining. Stop whining. Get your friends and your family together and stand up for this country that has stood as a beacon of hope around the world for 200 years. As Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor wrote in the final words of her dissent to this terrible ruling, 
Never in the history of our republic has a president had a reason to believe that he would be immune from criminal prosecution if he used the trappings of his office to violate a criminal law. Moving forward, however, all former presidents will be cloaked in such immunity. If the occupant of that office misuses official power for personal gain, the criminal law that the rest of us must abide will not provide a backstop. With fear for our democracy, I dissent. And with belief in our democracy, I'm in a fight. And I hope you will join me. Okay, President Joe Biden, as he makes comments on two things, uh, climate change, and he'll appear um, from the Center of Operations in Washington, D.C., and on um, emergency services, and he um, his other comments are going to be on the U.S. Supreme Court ruling that offers the president immunity from all criminal charges. The presidency is the most powerful office in the world. It's an office that not only tests your judgment, perhaps even more importantly, it's an office that tests your character. Because you not only face moments where you need the courage to exercise the full power of the presidency, you also face moments where you need the wisdom to respect the limits of the power of the office of the presidency. This nation was founded on the principle that there are no kings in America. Each, each of us is equal before the law. No one, no one is above the law, not even the President of the United States. With today's Supreme Court decision on presidential immunity, that fundamentally changed. For all, for all practical purposes, today's decision almost certainly means that there are virtually no limits on what a president can do. This is a fundamentally new principle, and it's a dangerous precedent because the power of the office will no longer be constrained by the law, even including the Supreme Court of the United States. The only limits will be self-imposed by the president alone. This decision today has continued the court's attack in recent years on a wide range of long-established legal principles in our nation, from gutting voting rights and civil rights, to taking away a woman's right to choose, to today's decision that undermines the rule of law of this nation. Nearly four years ago, my predecessor sent a violent mob to the U.S. Capitol to stop the peaceful transfer of power. We all saw it with our own eyes. We sat there and watched it happen that day. Attack on the police, the ransacking at the Capitol, a mob literally hunting down the House Speaker, Nancy Pelosi, gallows erected to hang the Vice President, Mike Pence. I think it's fair to say it's one of the darkest days in the history of America. Now the man who sent that mob to the U.S. Capitol is facing potential criminal conviction for what happened that day. And the American people deserve to have an answer in the courts before the upcoming election. The public has a right to know the answer about what happened on January 6th before they asked to vote again this year. Now, because of today's decision, that is highly, highly unlikely. It's a terrible disservice to the people of this nation. So now, now the American people have to do what the courts should have been willing to do, but will not. The American people have to render a judgment about Donald Trump's behavior. The American people must decide whether Donald Trump's assault on our democracy on January 6th makes him unfit for public office in the highest office in the land. The American people must decide if Trump's embrace of violence to preserve his power is acceptable. Perhaps most importantly, the American people must decide if they want to entrust the president once again, the presidency, to Donald Trump, now knowing he'll be even more emboldened to do whatever he pleases whenever he wants to do it. You know, at the outset of our nation, it was the character of George Washington, our first president, to find the presidency. He believed power was limited, not absolute. And that power always resides with the people, always. 
Now, over 200 years later, with today's Supreme Court decision, once again, it will depend on the character of the men and women who hold that presidency that are going to define the limits of the power of the presidency, because the law will no longer do it. I know I will respect the limits of the presidential powers I have for three and a half years, but any president, including Donald Trump, will now be free to ignore the law. I concur with Justice Sotomayor's dissent today. She, here's what she said. She said, in every use of official power, the president is now a king above the law. With fear for our democracy, I dissent, end of quote. So should the American people dissent. I dissent. May God bless you all, and may God help preserve our democracy. Thank you. And may God protect our troops. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are honored to welcome President Joseph Biden to the district's Emergency Operations Center. We call it the EOC. Uh, we just came from a briefing with the president and members of his cabinet on extreme weather. And I want to recognize and thank Secretary Mayorkas, uh, who has been with us here at the EOC when we opened it in 2023. Uh, this state-of-the-art facility was built um, with the President's help um, with a $7.5 million grant from DHS. I want to thank all of the members of the EOC team that you see behind us, Mr. President. They work daily with partners across the district to keep us safe. Uh, we have activated this EOC more than two dozen times since opening last year. I've had to declare 34 heat emergencies. And as we know, and we've um, been briefed on today, they're happening earlier and lasting longer. In the, in, in the middle of a heat emergency, for example, last year, this EOC responded to Canadian wildfires and the impacts of those fires on uh, our city. A month later, we activated again when we had a short um, but devastating uh, storm in, part, in a part of DC. And we're seeing more and more of the heat. The heat is more extreme. The rain is more severe. And in the winter, we're also seeing swings of one extreme to the other. Uh, we are proud, Mr. President, uh, to work with you uh, and it, because of your bipartisan infrastructure law, DC will receive over $3.5 billion to upgrade our infrastructure so that our city is more resilient. Uh, we know uh, that this is the, the hard work of government the quality of our lives and our children's lives depend on this work, and our future depends on this work. Uh, and we know that with the leadership of the Biden administration, we'll get this right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, our President Joe Biden. Good afternoon. Now, if my father were here, he's looking down. He's at turn and say, I apologize for my back. <laughs> very impolite to talk to my back to you. Thank you very much. You're doing a hell of a job, all of you. Look, <clears throat> Mayor, thanks for that introduction and joining me today at the D.C. Emergency Operations Center. I also want to thank the first responders who risk their lives every single day running into danger to save others while everyone's running away from danger. I'm here to talk about how we're preparing and responding to the dangerous impacts of extreme weather and the climate crisis that's affecting people all around America, all around the country, as a matter of fact, beyond around America. You know, summer has just started. Already, already, tens of millions of Americans are under heat warnings from record-shattering temperatures. Last month here in D.C., temperature at 100 degrees. In Phoenix, Arizona, 112 degrees. In Las Vegas, 111 degrees. Above normal temperatures also are expected for much of the country in July, especially in central and eastern United States. Extreme heat, this is, a, I think, going to surprise a lot of people, not you all, but extreme heat is the number one weather-related killer in the United States. More people die from extreme heat than floods, hurricanes, and tornadoes combined. I say that again, combined, more people die from heat than those three other major issues. 
And look, right now we're also tracking Hurricane Barrow, which is passing through the Caribbean. It's the earliest time ever a dangerous Category 5 hurricane has been recorded in American history. People impacted islands and communities are in our prayers, and we stand by to provide assistance to them. Look, extreme weather events drive home a point that I've been saying for so long. Ignoring climate change is deadly and dangerous and irresponsible. These climate-fueled extreme weather events don't just affect people's lives. They also cost money, they hurt the economy, and they have a significant negative psychological effect on people. Last year, the largest weather-related disasters cost over, get this, $90 billion in damages in America. $90 billion in damages. That's the cost so far, last, last year. They drove nearly 2.5 million people out of their homes, from Hawaii to Vermont. These events also pose serious threats to our nation's transportation system, to our power grid, farms, fisheries, and forests. In each case, costing lives and costing money. And the impacts we're seeing are only going to get worse, get more frequent, more ferocious, hitting our most vulnerable people in the most hardest hit communities in the world. Look, you know, we can change all that. So then our power. That's why today I'm announcing five new actions my administration is taking to address extreme weather, including heat and other hazards. The first, the Department of Labor is proposing a new rule that when finalized will establish the nation's first ever federal safety standard for excessive heat in the workplace. This includes things like developing response plans to heat illness, training employees and supervisors, implementing rest breaks, access to shade and water, you think we'd have to tell people access to shade and water. But it, I mean, gradually easing new employees into heat environments. Across the country, workers suffer heat stroke or even die just doing their jobs. This new rule will substantially reduce heat injuries, illnesses, and deaths for over 36 million workers to whom it will apply. From farm workers to construction workers, postal workers, manufacturing workers, and so much more. You know, I want to thank Vice President Harris for the work she has done since she was in the United States Senate that led to this rule. Second, in the coming days, my federal emergency management will also finalize a rule to improve our nation's resilience against flooding. Resilience. FEMA will now factor into the effects of future flooding for any federally funded construction project. That is, you can look at what caused the damage, what broke down, and what the best way to repair it is not just bring, bring it back to what it was, but prioritize making it better. Prioritize nature-based solutions to, re to reduce risk of floods. Look, third, <coughs> FEMA is announcing, <coughs> excuse me, nearly $1 billion in grants for over 650 projects across the country that help communities protect against natural disasters, including extreme heat, storms, and flooding. These grants will also help advance my Justice 40 initiative to deliver at least 40% of overall benefits of clean transit, clean energy, and climate investment to devastated communities, to the poor communities always left behind. Fourth, the Environmental Protection Agency is releasing a new report showing the continued impacts of climate change and the health of the American people and on our environment. This report will help us prepare better, respond faster, and save more lives. And fifth, later this summer, my administration will convene the first ever White House Summer on Extreme Heat, bringing together state, local, tribal, and territorial leaders and international partners who are protecting communities and workers from extreme weather every single solitary day. You know, along with these actions, another reason why we're here today is to get the word out so folks know these resources are available to them and anyone who needs them. You got, I was tell, telling the group who briefed me earlier, my brother has an expression, you've got to know how to know. We think everybody understands the government. It's complicated. We want the American people to know help is here, how to get that help. Follow the guidance from local leaders and public safety officials. Stay indoors, somewhere cool if you're vulnerable. Be careful on hot pavement. Know the signs of heat stroke like headache, nausea, and dizziness. And always have water with you whenever you're outside this summer. Today's announcements build on historic action my administration has already taken to address extreme heat events. And we launched a new website, heat.gov. Let me say it again, heat.gov. 
that shares life-saving information <coughs> and links a new <coughs> heat risk tool to help communities forecast extreme heat. Just enter your zip code and see the heat forecast not only generically, generally, but in your community where you're living. And we'll get back to exactly what the heat forecast for your neighborhood is. My Department of Labor also created the first ever national program to protect workers from heat stress. We've invested billions to enhance our power grid, expand energy shortages so that lights, air conditioning, refrigeration, internet, stay on during heat waves, storms, and other climate changes. It's building back a different way. All told, we've invested a record more than $50 billion for climate resilience, including against extreme heat and wildfires. But that's not all. The American, my American Rescue Plan is helping states and cities promote energy efficiency, reduce the impacts from flooding, and open cooling centers. People have to know where to go, where they can go in their neighborhood. They don't, it's just not automatic. Through the bipartisan infrastructure law, we're delivering over $20 billion to lower your energy costs, upgrading the electric grid to withstand stronger heat waves <coughs> and storms. And my Inflation Reduction Act, the most significant climate investment ever in the history of the world, anywhere in the world, has already created 300,000 new jobs, building clean energy we need to cut our emissions and to lead the world. Unfortunately, my predecessor and the MAGA Republicans in Congress are trying to undo all this progress. They still deny climate change even exists. They deny climate change even exists. They must be living in a hole somewhere at the expense of health and safety of their own constituents. They deny it exists. Every single congressional Republican voted against the investments which created these jobs and combat climate change. Many of them are trying to repeal those climate provisions and kill those jobs. I quite frankly think it's not only outrageous, it's really stupid. Everyone who willfully denies the impacts of climate change is condemning the American people to a dangerous future and either is really, really dumb or has some other motive of that. How can you deny there's climate change, for God's sake? Let me close with this. When disaster strikes, there are no red states or blue states. I've demonstrated that. I said no matter whether you vote for him or not, everyone's going to get treated fairly. They're just communities, not red communities, blue communities. They're just communities, families looking for help. And my administration is going to be there for you every step of the way. We just have to remember who we are, for God's sake. We're the United States of America. The United States of America, there's nothing, nothing, nothing beyond our capacity if we work together. So God bless you all. We're just getting started here, man. I'm confident we're going to get this done. Okay, so uh, let's move on to the United Nations Security Council uh, floor as we're going to hear what is happening with um, Gaza and humanitarian efforts and the efforts to get supplies, goods, and help the people of Gaza get back to to living a with human dig dignity again. All right. Go ahead. You are in. The meeting of the Security The meeting of the Security Council is called to order. First of all, on behalf of the Council, I would like to paid tribute to His Excellency Mr. Hwan Jun Kuk, permanent representative of the Republic of Korea and his team for their service as president of the council uh, for the month of June. Uh, the provisional agenda for this meeting is the situation in the Middle East, including the Palestinian question. Uh, the agenda is adopted in accordance with the Rule 39 of the council's provisional rules of procedure. I invite Uh, the Senior Humanitarian and Reconstruction Coordinator for Gaza pursuant to Security Council Resolution 2720 to uh, Madam Sigurd Kog to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. Soviet the Security Council will now begin its consideration of Item 2 of the agenda. And I would now like to give the floor to uh, Madam Sigrid Kog. 
Mr. President, Excellencies, nearly nine months have passed since the horrific terror attack by Hamas against Israel on the 7th of October. The scars of that day run deep. The pain of the hostages, the torment for their families, is a constant reminder to the Israeli people and political life. During this same period, Palestinian civilians in Gaza have been plunged into an abyss of suffering. Their homes lie shattered, their lives upended. The war has not merely created the most profound of humanitarian crises, it has unleashed a maelstrom of human misery. The public health system, as you know, has collapsed, schools destroyed, and the disrupted education system threatens acutely future generations. With summer temperatures soaring and severe shortages of basic services, such as waste management, sanitation facilities, and water supplies, the specter of outbreaks of infectious and communicable diseases looms large. Following the Israeli offenses against Rafah since the 6th of May, over one million people have been displaced once again, desperately seeking shelter and safety. 1.9 million people are now displaced across Gaza. I'm deeply concerned about reports of new evacuation orders issued into the area of Khan Yunis. Its impact on the civilian population is deep. In Gaza, nowhere has, is safe. Behind every statistic, Mr. President, is a human story of hope, dignity, and aspirations. And in my visits to Gaza, I met with voices that echo a single heart-wrenching question. Will our suffering ever end? Mr. President, it cannot be repeated often enough. We need an immediate, full, and complete ceasefire in Gaza. We demand the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages and unimpeded and continuous access to deliver aid at scale throughout the Gaza Strip, in line with Security Council Resolution 2735. International humanitarian law and international human rights law must be respected by all. Protection of civilians remains the paramount priority. UNRWA must be allowed to deliver on its mandated role. Mr. President, since our last briefing, I've continued to engage with key governments and other regional stakeholders at the highest political levels. I met Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and key cabinet members again two weeks ago, further to Security Council Resolution 2720. The resolution establishes a framework to expedite, streamline, and accelerate the delivery of humanitarian assistance throughout Gaza. As expected, this has been fraught with challenges, yet deliverables include the establishment of additional supply routes. The streamlining and facilitation which has taken place, whilst the space for acceleration remains very much subject to political will, as well as the enabling environment and conditions on the ground. There is no substitute for political will. In addition, the resolution mandated the establishment of a mechanism for monitoring and verification of humanitarian assistance. And the mechanism is now capturing humanitarian aid shipments from Jordan, Cyprus, Israel, and the West Bank into Gaza, ensuring greater volume at certain times. I underline at certain times. Transparency and prioritization. Its establishment is in a matter of months is the result of tremendous collaboration and support from UNOPS. The activation of the mechanism for supplies from Egypt is expected by mid-July. Subject to, appro to approval of their visa, UN monitors are getting ready to deploy to the mechanism's newly established offices in Gaza, and options are being discussed on the feasibility and longer-term planning of the Cyprus Maritime Corridor with continued direct access to Gaza. Finally, the mechanism will also serve as the main platform to facilitate entry into Gaza of all critical humanitarian items, consolidating existing practices further to the intent of the resolution. I encourage member states to continue to preposition supplies and to allocate financing to humanitarian agencies. Additional contributions are urgently needed to address and meet the gap of the 2.5 billion flash appeal. As foreseen, Mr. President, by the resolution, in September this year, I will submit my last report to this Council, at which I will also share my broader observations. Mr. President, during my last briefing, I reported that on the 5th of April, the Israeli War Cabinet made several commitments with regard to Resolution 2720. My mission has been monitoring the implementation of these and other commitments, some of which are in place. These include 
the direct entry of humanitarian aid to Gaza from the north via Zikim and er the Eretz crossings, as well as the use of the port of Ashdod. Approval for the resumption of the electricity line into the desalination facility in Khan Yunis. While the Nahal Oz water line was also opened, I note that this morning there are reports that would indicate the water line was unfortunately damaged again in hostilities last night. Permission to enter select medical items, for instance UNFPA's maternity wards and field hospitals in northern Gaza. Further, critical communication and protective equipment, which are vital for the UN and broader humanitarian operations in Gaza, have recently been approved and transferred to Gaza, while discussions on other essential items are still ongoing. Continued use of Gate 96 to allow the entry of humanitarian supplies and fuel. We have seen an increase in the volume of commercial cargo entering Gaza, albeit irregularly, and we are in discussion to ensure commercial supplies are in line with the immediate needs of the population, meeting the humanitarian requirements. Mr. President, Prime Minister Netanyahu has made further commitments to expedite the delivery of essential supplies for water, sanitation, waste management, and medical and educational needs. Urgent action is needed. Following last week's evacuation of 21 Palestinian children with serious illnesses and their accompanying adults from Gaza to Egypt via the Kerem Shalom, Kerem Abu Salem crossing, discussions are ongoing to establish a more regular and predictable system of medical evacuations for patients, facilitated by WHO. In, in view of the immense need, I consider this a priority and ask for your urgent attention and support. Mr. President, in line with the resolution, a sustained flow of assistance to Gaza is needed to deliver quantity and quality of goods throughout all land and sea crossings, including the Rafah border crossing. This requires a continued focus. The ability of the UN and humanitarian partners to operate safely and securely inside Gaza is equally important in view of the ever-growing risks. Since the start of the Israeli military operation in Rafah and the subsequent closure of the Rafah border crossing in early May, the volume of aid entering into Gaza or being distributed across Gaza has dropped significantly. Military activity and the lack of safe routes inside Gaza continue to severely impact humanitarian operations. A near total breakdown of civil order has further led to an environment of lawlessness and criminality. This worrying trend further hampers the UN's ability to deliver on its mandate. Many of you will be familiar with images of supplies accumulated at Kerem Shalom, Kerem Abu Salem crossing. The UN has asked Israel to find solutions to enable this safe delivery of aid that includes its distribution. Aid that should be reaching Palestinian civilians across the Gaza Strip. Since the 26th of May, trucks from Egypt have temporarily been rerouted via Kerem Shalom, Kerem Abu Salem. To further the reopening of the Rafah border crossing, my mission has submitted proposals to the parties with regards to possible reopening of the Rafah border crossing based on options provided. Mr. President, urgent action remains required with regards to the following. The establishment of an effective, credible, and predictable deconfliction and coordination system across Gaza. Discussions on this matter are currently underway, as you know. Continued access to all security and communication equipment as well as the critical humanitarian items needed for the delivery or repair of basic services. Route clearance from mines and unexploded ordinances and the approvals urgently needed to undertake these assignments. Prepositioned storage and the movement of the daily needed volume of fuel. Import of spare parts and relevant maintenance e uh, equipment. And concerning the diversification of routes as well as the sustainability of supplies, we need a further scaling up of the Jordan Corridor, the expansion of volume of aid entering via Tzikim and the Eretz crossings respectively, the opening of additional crossings, especially to South Gaza, and consideration of movement of aid from North to South Gaza. And last but not least, the urgent reopening of the Rafah border crossing, also with a view to the important planning for recovery and reconstruction. Mr. President, while humanitarian assistance will be required for years to come, planning and preparing for the early recovery and reconstruction of Gaza is essential. We cannot ask Palestinian civilians to put their future on hold 
while they'll cling to their human dignity under the most inhumane circumstances. Establishing the framework and priorities for early recovery and reconstruction is both political and technical. While politics and conditions on the ground may dictate the pace and the nature of these efforts, preparations should not wait. Let's look at what can be done now to complement and support the humanitarian response. Palestinians, young and old, in Gaza should not be asked to wait. The Palestinian Authority has a critical role to play in the Gaza Strip. The Palestinian Authority is integral to planning for the implementation of Gaza's recovery and reconstruction. And the international community must ensure the Palestinian Authority's financial stability and support its reform, governance, and other capacities needed to reassume its responsibilities in Gaza. I would also like to underline that the creation of a modern local economy across the Gaza Strip should be a priority. Palestinians cannot be expected to depend on humanitarian assistance alone. Commercial activities need to grow and the private sector needs to be revitalized. The 2720 mechanism that has been established can be used to facilitate a scale up, the acceleration and expedition of all goods needed for Gaza, needed for the early recovery and reconstruction. This is beyond the current humanitarian focus. Mr. President, ambitious reconstruction planning also requires ambitious and generous financing. This means the international community needs to consider a range of financing options and instruments, from traditional development financing to the establishment of new trust funds to tried and tested innovative financing instruments with a view to sustaining the necessary level of investments and guarantee financing flows including those from the private sector. But when we talk about recovery, reconstruction, or financing, this can be abstract. But if we view it through the human lens, the lens of our fellow human beings, it means the following. Dignified shelter, while more permanent housing is being built and or refurbished. The restoration of basic functioning health, sanitation, and water systems. The urgent rehabilitation of schools, or the establishment of other places of learning relevant to education, the creation of income generating jobs, sustained and specialized mental health and psychosocial support services, support to local civil society organizations or non-governmental organizations, particularly those led by those inspiring young people or the strong women of Gaza I keep meeting on every visit. Special attention and support is needed to the estimated 17,000 children orphaned by this war alone. And to restore people's dignity and quality of life, we need to urgently extend our hand to those with disabilities, including the vast number of young and old civilians that have suffered amputations and require constant support, including the import of prostheses. Some of this work should start now, despite the conditions on the ground, and it deserves the unwavering international support. Mr. President, Resolution 2720 has achieved intended and significant progress, but there is no substitute, as I mentioned, for political will. There is no substitute for the full respect of international humanitarian law, especially when it comes to the protection of civilians and the safe and enabling environment to secure effective distribution. Although intentions and commitments may be convincing, the only credible measure of change and progress are the improvements in the lives and well-being of, of Palestinian civilians in Gaza. There's a long road to travel to realize this, and much more remains to be done lest we fail the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. And of course, it remains our duty to advocate for lasting peace between Israel and a fully independent, viable, and sovereign Palestinian state alongside a safe and secure Israel. Mr. President, I have a last four lines from a Palestinian girl in Gaza given to me on one of my field visits. It's not necessarily in my style, but I would like to read it for you. I will do so, however, in Arabic. Ana Fatma al-Masri. Uh, my name is Fatima al-Masri. Uh, I'm eight years old. I'm from Gaza. I love my country. I love my friends. I live in a camp. I would like to live in a, in a home, in a house, like all other children. We owe it to all children. Thank you. 
Hey, uh, next is a uh, segment is the UN Security Council stakeout as the press gets asked questions of what was said on the um, UN Security Council floor. Uh, they will ask questions uh, from the Russian Federation uh, representative and they will also ask uh, Questions from the guests that you just heard, um, who uh, is one of the senior humanitarian effort representatives in Gaza. It's been six months since the Secret Cup took to this job. Yes. Did things improve in your opinion? Uh, look, uh, she's trying, uh, uh, but you, we have to realize that uh, again, with all uh, the best uh, will she's trying to implement the mechanism, it really doesn't function because of the absence of the ceasefire. The absence of the ceasefire, the absence of the ceasefire, and the absence of the ceasefire. Uh, it's very difficult. Uh, uh, the humanitarian organizations are not properly working in the, in the strip. Uh, the humanitarian deliveries are limited. Uh, there are issues with them. Uh, also, there are a lot of them uh, which are on the border between Egypt and, and the Gaza, which are not entered. The, the number of the number of trucks uh, is. Uh, is very low, it does not uh, provide for the needs of the Palestinian people. Uh, so that's it. I mean, everything is bad. And that, that is again because of the absence of the system. Thank you. What about the uh, emphasis on Hamas not uh, abiding by the ceasefire? Uh, we were saying many times. Yeah. We heard that allegedly Israel, Israel uh, agreed uh, for the implementation. But then we heard at the same meeting, where we adopted the, the, the latest resolution, that Israel will not be negotiating with Hamas. That Hamas came up with uh, their view of how the resolution should be implemented, and it was immediately accused of, uh, of refusing the deal. I mean, negotiations mean what that countries talk and negotiate with, that, with, with each other how the deal will be implemented. But, but uh, whatever Hamas said, to the, uh, to the proposal that oh, it was initially put on the table was that rejected. Now Hamas is being accused of non, uh, non complying with the resolution, not, not willing to implement it, etc. I, I have again to say to the record that Israel was the first uh, to, to announce it, despite, despite all the assurances that the US administration was giving to the proposal. Abdelhamid Sayam from the Arabic Daily Al Quds Al Arabi, so I just want to record my. You have been six months in the job, Madam. Your report is confusing. Sometimes you talk about progress, sometimes you talk about a very uh, pessimistic situation. So, how you evaluate your six months of work? Did the Palestinians get any benefit from this appointment? 
Well, it's not about my appointment. It's not about me. I think you have to look at it through the lens of the resolution. The resolution asks two things. Facilitation, expedition, and acceleration of humanitarian assistance. One second part is the establishment of a mechanism to underpin this. I'll start with the second part. The mechanism is operational, up and running. It enabled the establishment of additional supply routes, Cyprus, importantly Jordan, the Jordan Corridor. Uh, it enabled also the opening, the temporary reopening of the port of Ashdod, uh, the opening of Tsikim uh, and West Eretz, which allowed for aid to go to the north, which has actually been very important in the recent period. Now, the closure of the Rafah border crossing, of course, so extremely important since the military invasion uh, in, in Rafah by the Israelis, has undercut the ability to bring significant volume and sustain that. There's another leg to a changing situation in a war zone, which of course is the lawlessness and the breakdown of civil order, which makes it very hard for the humanitarians, UN included, to come and receive aid and subsequently distribute it. So there are bits of progress, and of course in the overall uptake as a Palestinian civilian in Gaza, can I be sure that the type of aid I need and the scope of goods I need for my human dignity? No, this falls far short. And this is on the international community. This is why we keep briefing and updating, and this is why I keep going back to Jerusalem and Tel Aviv to make these points, to ask, and to see where we can actually achieve. Recent commitments on medical evacuation is one. What's needed for water and sanitation, given the looming public health crisis in Gaza, waste management, etc. But I think my report is quite comprehensive. Thank you. Uh, Mike? Two questions, Ms. Cog. Number one, uh, other than laying out the facts on the ground for the Council today, did you make any specific recommendations to them uh, going forward? And secondly, much has been made of the tensions between the UN and, and uh, Israeli authorities in terms of getting humanitarian aid going. What have those discussions been like in terms of your personal experience? Well, I'll start with the, the last question. Um, I have been uh, well received. I keep having access to the highest levels and I have important conversations to obviously focus on the implementation of what's so important, which is sustained flow of assistance of a broad nature into the Gaza Strip to assist civilians. Equally so to make sure that we can verify and monitor uh, and, um, and that those take place in a in a correct and a constructive atmosphere and there's an ongoing need. Members of my team are also in close contact. The first part, uh, the tensions as you said, it depends on which area of work you would speak to. I'll stick to uh, what is most relevant to Security Council Resolution 2720. That is of course the data. Uh, we see an ongoing discussion about X number of trucks either uh, piling up at Kerem Shalom or the goods and the ability of the UN actually to come and collect it and distribute it. You see a data gap there. Um, and those are obviously con different conclusions that we draw. But what's actually interesting about the establishment of the mechanism, it has one database. You can see which types of goods go in, what's approved, what's denied, uh, and where's the follow-up. So hopefully we can also have a at least on that part a common ground in order to fix it and to solve it because the civilians in Gaza need as much as possible. They need it sustained and they don't need it tomorrow, they need it way back when. Frank, thank you so much. Ms. Kag, you mentioned the importance of having political will and also you mentioned that you met uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. How would you describe his attitude towards the humanitarian situation and did you sense that he has any political will have the humanitarian uh, situation be relieved there. Also, many other delegates today and ambassadors said that nothing really can be done short of a complete ceasefire of the humanitarian. Do you share that assessment as well? Well, I think if we go back to the, the essence, indeed, uh, the International Community Secretary General of the Council has been asking uh, early on for, uh, for a ceasefire, the release, unconditional release of all hostages. And that, of course, would be a significant game changer when we talk about conditions on the ground, the ability of the United Nations and uh, all the other international NGOs and local NGOs to reach people to actually do their work. Uh, I'm not uh, in the habit not as a politician and not now, uh, of uh, giving sort of uh, personal comments on 
attitudes or comments of others. I care about a correct and constructive meeting that I have in a professional uh, engagement. And ultimately, what matters, what I've said in the Council, commitments and intent are good or intentions, but what matters is the shift and the change on the ground, what we can see and what we can measure. That's the only metric at the end of the day that matters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Policy and Rights here on Depictions Media Radio. I've been your host, Michael Cloggs. Final thoughts. Don't hold back. T- tell, tell your representatives, your government representatives, those that you voted into office, how you feel about the job they're doing. There's a petition in Canada that that needs to... Needs to see some some action so that you know if, if if politicians aren't doing the job they're supposed to be doing then we should have the right to vote them back out of office that we shouldn't have 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 to worry about oh we're going to pay them their golden pension they shouldn't if they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing they shouldn't earn the golden pension So, um, go back a couple episodes and listen to um, the freedom, um, the the leaders of, of the of the freedom rally, as they pose a petition to call a confidence vote early and trigger an early election, so that the people can say, "Hey." No, you didn't do the job you you did. Or, yeah, you did do the job we were supposed to. So that we can see real change and economic change in economic relief uh, in, in Canada. And as far as, of course, if you're listening from the United States, we, we, you, you guys got to do something about what the Supreme Court of the of the United States did their ruling there has to be something done that we got to get better people in in those seats in those offices so that we the people can be heard thank you again for listening to policy and rights help us spread the love subscribe wherever you may see it give us support of course so that we can keep bringing you these stories about what is happening around the world with democracy and who we are as a human race. show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.